Hello, and welcome back to the Sign and Babble podcast. Today's episode is the first episode on PRC, but before we get into the main episode, I just want to give a few updates because obviously I haven't uploaded an episode in a while, and I just wanted to explain sort of what's been going on and what will be going on with this podcast in the future. So, first of all, just to explain the infrequent uploads, for those of you who don't know, I have been doing my PhD but I finally handed in my thesis this month. So I should be able to go back to a regular schedule of one upload every two weeks from now on, usually on the 1st and 15th of the month. The second point I wanted to make is that we're moving into communist China now, and this is basically my specialty, especially early communist China. So we can veer away from the safer topics of political and economic overviews and look more into culture, art, subsections of society, international relations, and things like that. If you have any ideas for things that you would like to learn more about, feel free to email me at info at sinobabble.com. I'd love to hear any suggestions. Finally, I've had a few people tell me now that they do like the episodes, but they find it difficult to keep up with all of the names. Well, if that's you, I'm here to tell you that you can officially forget the majority of names that you've learned up until this point. And in general, don't try and memorise too many names. I'll tell you which ones are important and which ones are just important for that episode. Okay, now on to the actual episode itself. So in the last episode, we went over how the CCP were able to defeat the incumbent nationalist government and send Chiang Kai-shek packing to Taiwan, where he and the nationalists were to remain. We'll get into why Taiwan stayed Taiwan and wasn't immediately invaded by the CCP in a later episode, but for now we'll be focusing on how the CCP consolidated their power on the mainland and how they sought to undo the years of chaos that the country had been gripped by for almost half a century. This is quite a lot of content to cover, so we'll be doing it over the course of a few episodes. For this episode, we're going to be talking about the very basics, namely the immediate aftermath of the civil war and the founding of the PRC, the structure of the Chinese government, and an overview of the major challenges that the CCP faced. Now, I know it doesn't sound overly riveting to have to dive deep into government structure, but it's really important. So after this episode, you'll be an expert on the structure of the Chinese state, And you'll never have to go through it again, so bear with it just this once. The People's Republic of China was officially founded on October 1st, 1949. There was a nice little ceremony held in Tiananmen Square, and if you search for a painting called The Founding Ceremony of the Nation by Dong Shi Wen, you can see an artist's interpretation of the scene. It's a very interesting oil painting in its own right, as it had to be revised multiple times due to the changing political fortunes of some of the people who appear in the painting. Someone's even removed and added back in later. It's pretty wild. A lot of it has to do with the Cultural Revolution and will make more sense later, but that's something that you can read about if you're interested. Anyway, on October 1st, there was a fun little military parade, and now it's a national holiday in China, although you probably have to work on the weekend to make up for some of the days that you took off, because yes, that is actually how public holidays work in China. Mao made a speech, introducing all his important bros, telling everyone how amazing the country was going to be from now on, etc. The plan for the formation of the new society was laid out in a document entitled The Common Programme for China which was formulated actually a little bit earlier than the ceremony, in September 1949. The programme was produced by a political consultative conference, or a gathering of members of different political parties in China, not too dissimilar to the one that the KMT and CCP had tried to hold after the end of World War II, the one that ended in disaster and the start of the Second Civil War. The major difference with this consultative conference was that the KMT were not invited. And this time, the conference went much better. A national anthem was chosen, along with a state name and a flag. The programme promised freedoms of speech, thought, publication, assembly, etc. Equal rights for women, universal education, rural reform through rent reduction and land redistribution, and the promotion and development of heavy industry. In the next episode, we'll be talking about how the ideas of universal education and women's rights actually played out in policies and laws that were introduced fairly quickly. 
They weren't perfect by any means, as China was a nation that had barely changed in terms of social practices for a couple of thousand years. So the CCP was battling truly entrenched traditions and customs that would not be so easily overturned. It'll be interesting when we get to the 1970s to talk about the return of some of these seemingly erased feudal practices in the post-Mao era, but that's a long way off for now. In terms of consolidating their power, the communists had a huge task ahead of them, one that most of their predecessors had failed to achieve, namely the unification of China politically, economically and socially. Not since the Qing dynasty had any one person or group been able to pull it off, but the Communist Party had a plan. The CCP's approach to consolidating power meant dividing up the work between the three main branches of the state, namely the party, the government and the army. The CCP had very few problems drumming up active support for their cause. In 1949, membership of the party stood at around 4.5 million, and by 1950, this had jumped to 5.8 million. They also had a lot of experience running a government, as they had managed to keep Yan'an afloat even while they were being attacked on all fronts during the Civil War and the war with Japan. While they had a huge rural support base and were able to continue with policies such as land reform that they had started in the mid-1940s, the cities were a different story entirely. Not only did the CCP not have any sort of power base in the cities, it didn't have enough cadres of urban background to support a mass overhaul of personnel in urban official institutions. Civil servants, police officers, teachers and other city officials were basically guaranteed their jobs and about 95% of them kept them. Their only requirement for the meantime was to agree to cooperate with the party and new government. In some cases, the revolutionaries who had worked with the party in the countryside for decades found that they were put in positions subordinate to some soft city official with no allegiance to the party because they were lacking in technical skills and knowledge. This compromise didn't last forever, however. The real changes to ideological thought would come not too much later as China moved into the mid-1950s. All in all, from about 1949 to 1953, there wasn't too much resistance to the new government. The people generally were glad to be shot of the extremely corrupt KMT, and they were excited for some stability. They were concerned with things such as inflation, rebuilding in the post-war era, and establishing peace. However, this is not to say that the party didn't need to move quickly to consolidate and legitimise their regime. Initially, the country was divided into six administrative regions, northwest, north and northeast, and southwest, south and southeast. These areas were initially administered by the military, but by 1952, full transition to civilian government under the centralised leadership of the CCP had been implemented across the country. Other key institutions included the propaganda department, which eventually took ownership of all media published in China and still has ownership over that media till this day, as well as the work teams that carried out mass mobilisation campaigns across the country were never called upon to do so, which was basically every single year. It was impossible for the party to have a fully developed claim to legitimacy as early as 1953, but as we'll see in later episodes, the party already had a strong base in the countryside and through campaigns, policies, purges, subtle manoeuvres and collaboration with personnel who would be useful for getting the party set up in urban areas, they were able to tie it all up together by about the end of the 1950s and into the 1960s, which is when the most extreme of all mass campaigns would be launched. So now we know roughly where the party stood in 1949-1950, I think it's a good idea to outline the framework of the state and the major institutions that made up the government. Yes, we're going to be talking about government structure. I will try and either find a good diagram to put on the website, or if not, I'll just make one myself just to make things visually clear. You can get a lot of this information from Wikipedia, but it's not exactly streamlined or very obvious, or it's not explained very well how important some institutions are over others, which ones are kind of just fronts or rubber stamp bodies, things like that. So I, what I want to do here is just kind of point out the most important institutions, uh, parts of the government and things like that. 
Not that much has changed about the structure of the Chinese state since 1949. There have been some small changes here and there, but they're not important for the purposes of what we're talking about now. The most important thing to bear in mind when talking about the structure of the PRC is that there is no real separation between government, party and military. They are all controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. So if we take modern times as an example, Xi Jinping is currently the president of China, the general secretary of the CCP and chairman of the Central Military Commission. So he runs the government and the party and the military. Power in China is centralised into extremely few hands, so luckily for us, we're not going to have to go through every single body that makes up the state in detail, and like I said, there won't be too many names. Let's talk about the party first, because this is the most important and maybe the most complex, though it's really not that difficult to wrap your head around it. To give a quick rundown, the party has a bunch of regional branches that go all the way down to the township level, and then every level above that, so up to the province, will also have a party branch with a party secretary. The regional branches are overseen by the Central Committee, which in 1949 had 44 members, 14 of whom constituted the Politburo, and only five of whom were members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. Okay, so the Central Committee is overseen by the National Congress of the party. So to give a recent example to help you differentiate between all these different levels, the National Congress meets every five years to discuss big, important party stuff, although back in the day they just used to meet whenever they felt like it. In the news, it's the one that they show where there's like 2,000 guys in a room clapping for five minutes whenever Xi Jinping walks in and voting for stuff that was basically predetermined by the top dogs before the meeting. The Central Committee within the National Congress, so you've got the National Congress as the largest, the next one up is the Central Committee, they do nothing, and then within the Central Committee you have the Politburo, which is where all the magic happens, this is where all the bigwigs meet to make the real important decisions behind closed doors, and then within the Politburo you have the Standing Committee, and this is the real powerhouse of Chinese politics, again even till this day. The Standing Committee of the CCP is the single most important body in China. To give you an idea, the current members include President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang and five other dudes who you don't really need to know about, but they're super important to running China. In 1949, the members of the Politburo were Mao Zedong, Liu Xiaoqi, Zhou Enlai, Zhu De and Chen Yun. If you are going to remember any names at all moving forward, I suggest it be the ones that you just heard. They are extremely important and their names will come up a lot. In fact, besides Deng Xiaoping, I don't think there's any other names I'll either be mentioning apart from people who are important in the context of a single episode. So I'll say them again for you just so that you can kind of stick them in your mind. Mao Zedong, Liu Xiaoqi, Zhou Enlai, Zhu De, and Chen Yun. Okay, perfect. That's everything you need to know about the party. Let's move on to government. The state council is the same thing as the government in China. So just remember that if you hear state council, we're talking basically about the Chinese government. The state council runs all the ministry, like the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the typical government bodies that you'd expect to see in any country. They're the civil servants who are responsible for collecting taxes and then using those taxes to run the trains, hospitals, schools. You get the picture. There are some ministries that existed in the 1950s that no longer exist today, but you don't really need to know about those in details. Just know that ministries equals state council equals government. The state council is presided over by the premier, who is the topmost senior civil servant. In 1949, this was Zhou Enlai. On the relationship between the general secretary of the party and the premier, the general secretary is kind of like the cool, charismatic guy who gets everyone on board with like the new ideas and pumped up for all the campaigns, while the premier is basically the geeky guy behind the scenes who has to do all the actual work and admin. 
I think that's a pretty good way of understanding the relationship between the party and the government in general. The party comes up with the ideas and decides, you know, in what direction that we're going. But the government sort of has to actually build the car that we're all going to get in and go to that destination in. Maybe a good modern parallel would be something like a Steve Jobs and a Wozniak thing. Maybe that solves Chinese politics, but basically just think about it like that. So the Premier is selected by the National People's Congress, or the NPC. The NPC is the highest organ of power in the Chinese state, and it's the nation's legislative branch. Its main duty is to sort of oversee the enforcement of the constitution, elect members of important offices, such as the president and vice president, and to do all the lawmaking and enforcement of the laws. In 1949, the chairman of the NPC was Liu Xiaoqi. They're sometimes criticised as basically being a rubber stamp body. I think this was probably more true in the 1950s till about the 1980s, but now not everything is so unanimous and they do actually make people revise laws before just passing them through. That's what happens when you get rid of a cult of personality, I guess. Below the NPC are a bunch of nine special committees dedicated to reviewing laws and suggesting policy changes in specific areas, such as ethnic law, environment, foreign affairs, and public health. Okay, so hopefully you're not too lost, but even if you are, don't worry, there's only one more. And like I said, there will be some sort of chart diagram thing on the website at sinobabble.com for you to check out. So if you just go to the podcasts and click on episode materials, you will find it in there. The final branch of the Chinese state is the military which is more generally known as the People's Liberation Army, or just the PLA. The commander-in-chief of the military at the founding of the PLC was Judah. It always surprises me that it wasn't Lin Biao. Lin Biao, you might remember him from the previous episode, and possibly a couple of other episodes as well. He was really crucial to the communist victory over the nationalists. He got some seriously clutch wins during the civil war, but he was basically outranked by Judah. But he makes his own comeback in the 1960s, and actually Lin Biao's got a really good conspiracy theory associated with his name, Uh, but that's for a later date, but it's also something to look forward to. I really like that one. Okay, to sum up, the top people are the Premier, President, Chairman of the Military, and General Secretary, and also, up until the death of Mao, Chairman of the CCP, which is not a role that exists anymore. The last four, the president, chairman of the military, general secretary, and chairman of the party, are all the same person for all intents and purposes. The bodies for the party that you need to remember are basically just the Politburo and the standing committee of the Politburo. The top bodies of government are the State Council and the National People's Congress, or the NPC. And the military is just the military. That's it. You don't need to go any more granular than that. It's a podcast, not an exam. Okay, so now you know how the Chinese state is structured. Congratulations, you now know more than probably the average undergraduate in a typical Chinese studies program. So for the last part of this episode, I just want to go over some of the major challenges that the CCP faced in the first four or five years after the founding of the PRC, so that you know what to expect in upcoming episodes. This is basically a preview or an overview of the content that you'll be hearing over the next few months. But like I said, if you see any gaps or if you think that you've got an idea for something you want to hear more about that I haven't mentioned, do feel free to get in contact and let me know. The biggest and most pressing challenge for the CCP after winning the war and nominally reuniting the country was that of economic reconstruction. Now, if they were following a strictly Marxist approach to the development of socialism in China, then what the CCP would have done was started by transitioning the economy to a completely capitalist one. For those of you who don't know, Marxist stages of history are basically slavery, followed by feudalism, then capitalism, socialism, and finally communism. Technically speaking, it was necessary for a nation to go through each of these stages in order to make the complete and perfect transition to full communism. Now, at this stage in time, China's economy was essentially a mixed feudal capitalist economy, 
as the developed eastern coastal areas and northern industrial areas, which had mainly been developed by Japan during the war, carried the sort of commercial front of China, while the rest of the country mainly practiced a feudal style of agriculture. There was actually even some slavery still mixed in there. Uh, For example, slavery was practiced in parts of Sichuan until the mid-1950s. So a complete transition to capitalism, followed by a swift but smooth transition to socialism, would have probably been the most orthodox approach. Now, as you probably could have guessed, this isn't actually what happened. Uh, Taking the capitalist road would have meant emulating Western countries, who were essentially the imperialist spiritual enemies of China, and thus the antithesis of communist principles. Further, the CCP had built its entire success on the backs of poor peasants, and so supporting any scheme that would have increased the profit of landlords and rich peasants would probably have been a very bad idea. They decided to play it safe instead, opting for a gradual process of the nationalisation and expansion of industry, particularly heavy industry, and the reinvestment of profits into industry and agriculture to develop China over a decade or two before going for the full-on socialism thing. A huge part of early CCP economic policy was essentially a reward for peasants who had supported them in the form of the land reform movement. Carried out primarily from 1949 to 1953, this was a process that destroyed the landlord system in the countryside and promoted a land-to-the-tiller system, where peasants could finally own the land that they worked on without having to pay rent. This policy was a means to an end, however, which we'll talk about more in the episode on economics, which I think is going to be in a couple of episodes' time. The other side of economic development was industry. Industrial expansion was the cornerstone of the CCP's growth strategy, and Shanghai especially became a critical focal point for the nationalisation project. Contrary to what you might think, however, there wasn't a sudden and forceful shift away from capitalism in the first four years of the PRC, and in fact the CCP actively cooperated with existing capitalists and other influential bourgeoisie in establishing a foothold in major cities. Again, we'll talk about this more in detail in the episode on economics, and probably in other episodes relating to urban culture and even the arts as well. Another early challenge was that of the sphere of influence, which can probably be best summed up as capitalism versus communism, the Cold War. Now, this is going to be a recurring theme throughout this period, so get ready to hear about sort of Cold War stuff quite a lot. One of the first things to happen basically as soon as the Chinese Civil War had ended was the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950. Barely a year after the CCP had taken power, they had to gather themselves up and march to the Yalu River and dive into what was essentially the first Cold War conflict between the USSR and the USA. The war was partly an act of loyalty on the part of the CCP and partly an act of border security regarding one of their neighbours, who would have come under the Americans' sphere of influence fairly easily had there not been any intervention. Today, China is obviously North Korea's closest ally, but in terms of relations with the Soviet Union, the payoff in terms of helping them in the Korean War was very short-lived. The relationship between China and the Soviet Union had basically completely broken down by the late 1950s. On the other hand, China was able to develop relationships with other socialist nations in Eastern Europe, which are quite interesting, so we'll be talking about those in a bit of detail too. While the CCP didn't necessarily have a huge problem getting people to join the party or support their policies, there was a slight problem in that China is really, really big, and even with over a million members or five million members, the party would have been pretty stretched to try and spread their policies effectively across the country while maintaining order. However, they did, in fact, manage to do so. So, Over the next few episodes, we're going to be talking about how the CCP formulated, launched and managed the mass campaigns that formed the key tool for the governance of China, especially Maoist China. Finally, another major set of challenges that we'll have to talk about are those of imperialism and colonisation. Now, as we've discovered throughout previous episodes, Chinese nationalism is based on a foundation of anti-imperialism, and 
despite the generous amount of help received from the US during the war, the Chinese people were willing to get up in arms at a moment's notice if any threat to their sovereignty appeared. Having said that, this didn't mean that China wasn't willing to dabble in some colonialist exploits of its own. Tibet, Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia have throughout history fallen in and out of the sphere of Chinese influence. Sometimes they're neighbours, sometimes they're the frontier of the empire, the wild tribes in the border regions, but by October 1951, the CCP had pretty much reclaimed these areas and reintegrated them back into China proper, making them part of the PRC. In future episodes, we'll be discussing how the Communist Party went about taking back these areas and what methods they used for social, economic and political integration. If you know anything about Tibet and Xinjiang, you'll know that the CCP's methods tended to be quite heavy-handed and there was, or is, no shortage of conflict in these regions. Each one of these places will probably need a whole episode, if not a couple of episodes, dedicated to explaining the complex and evolving nature between the periphery and the centre, but they should definitely be some of the most interesting ones. So that's it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you have a good idea now of what will be coming up over the next few months. Hopefully the uploads will be more regular from now on. And I might also try and slot in a few updates about the current situation in Hong Kong where I can. So look out for those as well. Don't forget to check out the Sinobabble website at sinobabble.com. And if you want to get in touch, do send an email to info at sinobabble.com, even if it's just to say how much you love the show. Thanks very much for listening, guys, and I hope you tune in next time.